Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online Meeting 207, fourth day of March, moving through the year. Feeling all right, feeling all right. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. As always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that weren't with us right here right now. Uh, let's go talk about what we're doing today. Today is looking like a long meeting, so if Bob and Sean hang with me, hopefully you guys can drop in and drop out and pick up on various parts of interesting things going on Wix admittedly a little bit towards the inside baseball at the end, but it's a really important topic that we need to talk about that has been on my list for a while, and that would be repro reorganization. However, we're going to do triage first. We actually have quite a few things to go through uh, to try to, uh, well, just to keep up, stay on top of that, and then we'll do our Wix v4 design discussion. We'll pick up at least one or two of those. Then we'll dig into this repro organization topic and then we'll do the questions and comments for anybody that sticks around with us uh, to the end. But without further ado, Bob, triage? Yes? Ready? Go for triage. Yay. All right. Here we go. Um, oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I forgot to um, – oh, dear. I forgot to put these in ascending order. I guess I'll start at the bottom and work up. Does that still work best for you, Bob? I don't. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, no, yeah. that's a, that's my sort order. Yes, as well. All right, all right. I'll I'll work up from the bottom. Sorry, my mistake. Let's see. Um, so I'm gonna just give a quick update on this rollback boundary. Is always discarded at the beginning of the chain. I have started looking at this. It's not simple. Um, I need to go back and re-listen to the video because I don't remember. Like, are we going to do the whole sub-transaction concept? Sean, like, I, if it really comes down to you, Sean, like, did, were you interested in doing the whole sub-transaction thing, if we can get the the model right of updating burn to do better with transactions, as we discussed in that meeting? I didn't remember where we left it as, yeah, we'd actually do it in the engine. Yeah, I think, I don't think we have to do it, because I think all the functionality is exposed today. I so see. all the all that would be doing is making it easier to understand for new people. Okay, so it's just about making the packages childs of transactions or whatever we end up calling the thing, right? right. Children of that. Okay. All right. Well, I have started digging into it. It's not easy because it goes through the grouping code um, and things like that. But I, I have not done enough to really say yes or no. So um, I'm going to keep this here. Um, it's also not been my highest priority thing with other things around the um, breaking changes and bigger bugs. So we'll come, I'm going to leave this here again. I know I'm keep holding on to this, but I will get to it and I don't want us to forget about it. So I'm going to leave it here. Although I guess it's preview zero. So if we need to bring it back, it's already there. Maybe we don't need it on triage. Because if I bring it back to kick it out of four preview, four oh preview zero, then we would discuss it then. Bob? Well, right now it's in essentially two lists, triage okay. and... I don't think it needs to be in triage because it's already in 4.0 preview zero, which we're, I'm rapidly closing down on my list. So, All right, let's take out our triage. I'm digging into this. I haven't mixed the idea as being too hard, but um, and then if I do, then I'll be back and saying, hey, I think we should punt this, and we'll do it then. Cool? Works for me. All right, enhance ability to enable debug logging. We were just chatting about this, Bob has done the work to do the command line version. What's left is the policy stuff, right? Yeah. So there's a new command line command line switch. Yep. Um, I, I inconveniently, as it turns out, suggested we could also do it via policy, but it turns out there is currently no support in burn or in digital for per user policy. Um, so we'd have to add that but then it occurs to me that there are other burn policy settings that might be impacted if we start supporting per user policy, like where does the per user package cache live, mm -hmm. which is something you, you can control today in HKLM policy. Location, location, right. Yeah, but anyway, so yeah, I, I agree it's a good idea to separate the command line switch, which is done, and the policy idea. Um, it, I don't think it's a bad thing, but we, yeah, you know, it requires some research and thinking about what per user policy means um, to the various kinds of policy that we support today. So, is there still interest in doing that in 4.0? Uh, 
I, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't hit my bar. It's like, I don't know that a lot of people use policy. Um, well, if you, I'm not going to get to it. So if you and Sean, are like, eh, it, it goes into 4X and it's a totally reasonable yeah, thing that we're going to pull out of there at some point. If some, yeah, it's, anyway. it's completely additive. It's completely additive. So, so it's, it's Sean. Yes, it can be 4X. Yeah. All right. Excellent. I think what Sean just said is, oh, I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, burn does not repair an MSI when slipstream with minor patch, um, uh, minor update patch. Um, yeah. And yeah, this, we, we talked about this last week. This is on me to, to research. Okay, great. Patch seems to include this is the same thing more than was yep. authored. Yep. Okay. Um, we have one, two, three more um, um, accessibility issues. I think these go in the accessibility bucket as in, yes, that would be great. Somebody... I think there was actually, Blair brought up on the first one. On the first one. That it might be that upgrading the control fixed this. These two could be closed. No, we don't want to take it in V3. Well, do we want to preemptively fix it and say, hey, go to try it in V4 when that comes about? And hope it turns well, out well? We've already fixed it. Oh, OK. I mean, part We're, of the problem is this guy doesn't respond to our questions, so. They're, they're, they're fulfilling a you know contractual obligation to report the bugs. Yeah. They don't actually care that they're fixed. They just care that they're reported. Right. Um, all right. Let's close it and say, yeah, cool. We, the, based on you know, based on Blair's analysis, yeah, it looks like it's good. And if it comes back, they're just going to open a new issue anyway. I don't even know if they bother searching for existing ones. So. Nope. I'm I'm all for that. Let's go ahead and kick those out. And at some point, we're going to have to ban this guy and be like, dude, you got to do a better job of looking at what you're doing because it's clear that we don't have the the skill set necessary to fix these things. So please stop just showing up and dumping them. <laughs> anyway, we'll see what happens there. All right, great. And then the, the third one's a duplicate. Great, they can go away then. Um, and he's already got, you know, one one mark, uh, one strike on his record. Um, Wix calculating required space wrong to install the setup. No, <laughs> this person wants per feature costing, which they could do, but Burn doesn't do that today. Um, so the size is based off of packages, and um, that's it. That's what it is today. So this is a feature request. Uh, is it going to happen in four? Probably not. Yeah, I don't really care about feature selection generally. I prefer breaking packages down into more selectable chunks than trying to use features in an MSI. So, all right, let's just say, yeah, totally reasonable feature, feature, totally reasonable feature, uh, feature si sizing by feature. <laughs> How are we to say that? Um, yeah, totally reasonable feature. Someone could write that. We're not doing that. Great. And that can get put in 4X. Uh, light, this is weird with not a lot of information. We experience this problem sometimes, not consistently. Light, weight completed due to an Amanda mutex. I don't, um, we use a mutex for ice serialization, as I recall. Mm -hmm. I think I added it in the long ago times. Okay. Um, let's put this in four preview zero only because I'm going to be doing the ice stuff very soon. So I will have this issue assigned to me and make sure I look at it. Um, and then probably make it, you know, make sure that we handle the weight essentially. Maybe the thing's timing out, or maybe the other weight mutex is getting killed, or who knows what. So I'll just make this more yeah. robust around the mutex handling. Fine. I will take that as I'm doing the other ice stuff. Um, implement decompiler extensions. So I open this based on the fact that the decompiler, um, we had a bunch of stuff in the decompiler that was holding on to other code that was dead. Um, none of it was appropriate for the way that Wix 4 works, so I just deleted all of it and put a to-do in it and open this issue to say, hey, we need to re-design, um, implement uh, decompiler extensions. Decompiler has not been a priority for us thus far, so I'm inclined to not put this in preview zero, even though it is interface breaking and you know, yeah, yeah, but since I don't think we're going to focus the decompiler down in preview zero, we should just revisit this in Wix 4.0. As in 4.0, but past preview zero. Right, not preview zero. So preview one. 
Yeah, four. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> we haven't really talked about. Yeah, we haven't got past that. Yeah, there's there's 120 or so issues that we are, we're going to have to go through um, at least once to kind of lay out what we do past preview zero. Um, and as I've been hinted, MS Build is like going to be my my biggest thing. Well, that's the biggest thing after preview zero. MS Build support is not in preview zero. And as I've dug into it more, I am more confident that m much more work needs to be done. So that's going to turn like the big thing. And there's a lot of issues all wrapped up in MS Build isms. Um, so I think this should go in that bucket as, yeah, let's really talk about how we should implement extensions, um, decompiler extensions in the V4 world. Um, we don't need that in preview zero. Unless somebody wants to fight me to put it that says it has to be in preview zero. No. Nope. All right. Great. Moving on. Um, cabinet spanning. This is currently broken. Uh, we probably need to bring it back in four. Um, people use it. Um, it's a kind of a pain to implement, but um, I think we should bring it back and forth. But we're just got. I don't really want to put it preview zero again. I don't feel the need to delay preview zero for cap spanning. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, sharing payloads between packages is broken. Sean. So there's a. There's a package ref on the payload symbol, which is, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a one-to-many relationship. Okay. So right now, if you try to share a payload, only one package is going to reference it. So it's not going to get cached and things are not going to work. All right. So where does this need to go? Does this need to be preview zero? Um, I guess not. I mean, does it change the language? It doesn't change the language. No. Okay. So somewhere in the binding compiling process, it's not connecting all the data. I mean, the the symbol data structure is wrong. You can't have a package ref on a payload because it's not a one to one relationship. Ah, I see. Mm. We need to look at that then. So I don't know how many people use this. Probably doesn't need to be in preview zero, but it is like a, it's not a tiny fix. Yeah. Let's say we can put it post preview zero. But it's going to have to get fixed pretty high. Preview, post preview zero. Or we take it now because it's going to break the symbols. Mm. There's something to that logic for preview zero planning. Yeah. All right, let's put it in preview zero. Go ahead and do that. Uh, do I need to take this one, Sean, to rejigger the symbols then? Or? Yeah, I'd rather work on other things. Okay. I'll have to go look at that. I haven't looked at that one. All right. Uh, Bootstrapper package compressed is wrong. So somehow the the compressed attribute for the Wix package information in the BA manifest is wrong. Is wrong. This could be simple. Um, all right. Again, do you want this one, or do I need to take it here? Yeah, I'd rather spend my time in burn okay. instead of core. All right, then I'll take that look at that in preview zero. Let's see if I can find it. Hopefully that. Thank you for having. I assume that test is there and like skipping yeah. right now. Yeah. For all three of these. Yeah, awesome. So this is going to be the same thing. It's supposed to override the information from the payload, and it's not doing so. Yeah, that's another yep. simple data structure problem. All right. Go ahead and give that to me, and I will. I'll ping you if I need more information. If I can't get it there. Um, next one. Um, this came out as I was doing some other work. Common is still sticking out, which is a really bad thing to have sticking out. So I just wanted to open this issue, and uh, I want to take this preview zero to minimize our public service area Wix toolset core, and go be very intentional about what's sticking out of Wix toolset core. And Common has a lot of 
tasty looking things. So you're going, ooh, I want to use that, and I don't want people thinking they should use that. And any other things that I haven't thought about that's sticking out of core, but this is the big one. Is this preview zero? Yeah, this is preview zero. I want to break this. I want to get this done. This is going to be relatively straightforward to implement. Well, this part is going to be very straightforward to implement. I don't know what else I'm going to find. <laughs> that's public, and that's I have to go. Um, do that. But I want to get that preview zero it's before anybody starts thinking they can take a the NuGet package of Wix toolset core and start building against it to get common or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this one. Um, NV3, when completing the linker work, uh, found that the linker was propagating the section IDs. Every row had a section ID on it. Symbols do not store their section IDs today. They just are part of a section. And the problem, of course, is when the linker runs, it flattens all those sections into one, so the symbols will lose with the section, the information of sections where they came from. Um, rows solve this by having a section ID on it. Now, this was added later, so it's kind of a bolt-on to rows. Um, but now looking at it, I'm wondering if symbols do need to store their section ID so that when they get merged, you can post link, figure out what sections a symbol came from. And I think the case for that's used is, or necessary is, um, unfortunately, I think it's patching. That's my best guess. Um, yeah, because otherwise you already have richer data in terms of source line numbers. Correct. For for someone, you know, just inspecting the symbol, wanting to find out where it came from, you already have richer data. Yeah, but I think this is for symbols so that they can do unfiltering. Um, yeah. I think that's why this was here. That's my best guess. Um, which also would be why I don't remember needing it for anything else, because it came late in patching when they were kind right. of bolting on stuff. The problem I don't I'm not really excited about is adding a section ID to every symbol now means that our intermediate's blown up that much more. Um, They're zipped. Yeah. So I I've guess. been doing a lot of work between three and four, you know, comparing outputs and the fact that, you know, Wix outs today, for example, don't zip the XML is kinda like Oh, yeah. Wait, the Wix out's twenty eight megs, but the Wixipole is Two and a half. Right. As long as parsing the JSON doesn't become, you know, a bottleneck. Well, it is a bottleneck, but that's mostly because of the parser we're using, and I just haven't decided what to do about that. Um, the parser we're using is poor. Um, but it's, it's very trivial, and it, it does show up in my profiling, but I have not figured out how to replace it um, with a dependency that I'm, you know, excited to bring in. Maybe I'll, we'll move the uh, system.text.json, which has been pretty stable, but like I don't want to take a dependency on Newtonsoft, for example, because that thing is a massive nightmare to deal with in its versioning. Um, anyway, um, so does this does this ring true to you, Bob? That section IDs on symbols, like does that? I, I mean, it, it makes sense. Um, the the timing certainly paints that picture. Yeah. Um, I, I don't recall, I don't know that I've spent much time in the actual filtering code, so I'm not sure I have any deeper insight there. Yeah, our filtering code. I mean, it should be present, right? It should be, you should be able to to see its use if that's what patching is doing. <laughs> yeah, because seeing what patching is doing is easy. Well, <laughs> I did not say that, <laughs> to be clear. I, I didn't even imply yeah. it. No. Um, no. I can, you're right. I can go back to V3 and see all the references to section ID and see how many there are. Yeah. And actually, I, you might want to look at the the, the uh, admin image support. Oh. Because I think you'll you'll get at least some decent confirmation. I think that that they. I think Peter did that, and he added the section ID to get, you know, basically fragment-free uh, filtering. Yeah. Which has, you, 
it's a you know it's a minor difference because if when you author it and you have the section ID and this is so what it's for when you're authoring and you have the section IDs you know filtering works at the fragment level when you use the admin image it's essentially you know every row is a fragment I see yeah and that's when we start talking about I remember that now we start talking about clustering and automatically tracking down foreign key relationships to build things like here, I patched this, and that means I need to go at least consider right. everything else. Yeah, to be able to do smart things, like at least on the component level, all this on improving our patch experience, patch filtering experience, which today is a bit challenging to use. People expect a feature ref to pull in everything associated with the feature. Yeah, not everything in this section. Right. I wonder if that's the way to go instead anyway. It might be. It's not the filtering is ID. confusing, and people do expect grouping to happen, and it doesn't. And Alternatively, if we're not worried about the size, then um, it doesn't harm it. I mean, there's no harm in, in tracking this, except for the. Yeah. And if I do the load code right, it would be a single instance string, so we're only paying for another field on every symbol. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, I guess this needs to go in preview zero. Yep. Because it's going to be... Ah, dang it. I was feeling good about myself yesterday. <laughs> Your preview zero list was getting longer, was getting shorter, but now it's getting longer again. Yeah, it's getting... It's like going to double today. Um, yeah, so this is a discussion. Um, what's his name? Uh, Jolivar? Lexi, is that it, Sean? Anyway, um, if you hover over his name, it'll show you. Oh, there we go. Andre? Anyway, he's been digging in quite well and finding things, even when I go back in three and track this down. And it looks like I broke this when I was trying to straighten out the um, embedded binaries, which is an absolute nightmare of code. And it still has some cross-component dependencies that concern me fragility in it there, but this ability to have a, a default file <laughs> reference and be able to have it get re-resolved appropriately is a thing. Um, so I need to go back and figure out how this is done in 3 and exactly how it needs to get fixed in 4 to work correctly. This is odd, it's like C++. <laughs> no space. Um, Anyway, this needs to go in preview zero, I think. Yeah, this probably this needs to go in preview zero. Um, and I'm I've already taken it. I need to go dig and figure out how I did that. But he's very kind to give a, a unit test that shows this not working. Um, so yeah, there's that. Cool, we made it through. Right? That's all. Sweet. All right. So let's go back and talk about our design discussions. Um, Sean, the top two are yours. Um, we've had this major upgrade table design flaw thing and burn for a while and it was a, I said something I think and you were like, I don't know what that means. So is that the one you want to start with or the custom yeah. table bootstrap application data? Y your call, either one of those. Um, I'm hoping both of those are going to be fast. Me too, because I want to get on to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's not so fast? Where it will, I don't know, it depends. We'll see what you guys say. Um, but yeah, let's go from there. All right, so you want to tee up the first one better than my memory is doing? Well, the problem is, is that we were talking with Jacob about the um, persisting the hidden variables, and then you list it out a bunch of design flaws in burn that you were wanting to fix. And this is the only one that I know about that isn't fixed yet. Ah. But I have no details on what you meant. Ah, okay. So the the issue with burn and major upgrades um, is or was um, the way that we automatically detect, um, the way that we detect if you're doing an upgrade. In particular, it's like if you have a detect only, I think we cal calculate every detect only um, 
row in your major upgrade as, oh, that means that we're doing a major upgrade or, or something to that effect. Uh, and they there are... should have fixed that already. Okay, so I mean, then that means that you have resolved this thing that I was worried about. And I, it was entirely possible that you're like, yeah, yeah, no, I fixed that by doing something else. I don't, how did you fix it though? I think that was one of the hard problems of how do you pick which one um, fixes I had it. To, I had to thread more information. Like when building the bundle, I needed to include more information about each upgrade row. Yeah. And then just the engine just had to ignore detect only rows when figuring out whether it's an upgrade or not. But how do you detect if it's an upgrade? Because detect only are the way that people trigger that, or that, or no, not upgrade. Maybe it's downgrade. Maybe it's downgrade. Yeah, it's downgrade. Oh, That's sorry, the it's not problem. upgrade. It's downgrade. My mistake. All right, same area of code, the other way around. And the reason it's more problematic is because the version numbers are basically completely unrelated to the package. Yeah, that's it. When, when you're uh, the the root, the biggest instance I saw of this problem is when you're using the upgrade table to do essentially product search in a bundle, mm -hmm. but you're doing it in a package. Mm -hmm. um, then your row, the upgrade table rows are completely unrelated to um, your package, but Burn doesn't doesn't recognize that. Like, doesn't oh, recognize yeah. that. And I thought we, we we had to get to the point where we were marshalling enough data about like, you know, the upgrade code and whether it's the you know, it's related to that package or not. Yeah, you basically maybe, could say which I of did, these detect statements are downgrade statements versus product search statements. So I did I'm pretty sure I did two things. I did the detect only rows ignoring for upgrade. I also started providing the product code so it can tell that whether it's actually a related product or not. But then this downgrade area, I'm I have not touched that part, so that might be the remaining. Yeah, part. that might be it. it. It's the essentially the detect the major upgrade can be used to product search or detect downgrades. And you can't tell from the upgrade table which is which. There's an intent in there. And just by looking at that, you're like, well, I mean, you could kind of guess. You're like, oh, well, that property gets assigned and then is used in a launch condition or is used in an error condition. Therefore, oh, it's blocking, you know, it's saying, yeah, you have a downgrade. But even then, you're just guessing, right? Could you be your product search and saying, you can't install this product when product B is on the machine? Not a downgrade, but still blocking. And of anyway. course, that could all be done via custom action. So, it's yeah. introspectable. Yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, so it was the, I think that in the end, I think that's where it all ends up. It's just, there's not enough information in the major upgrade table alone to know which one of these things are, uh, of which, what the intent was. And burn assumes the intent is downgrade and thus is wrong sometimes. That's the design flaw. I'll create an issue for that and... <laughs> probably leave it alone. I'm not sure, I'm not sure anyone is... Uh, I haven't seen anyone complain about that, so... Oh, we've had people complain about it in the past, but it's not hugely... About it, the downgrade? Yeah, about the upgrade. Well, maybe... The the biggest issue is that it, it, it causes, you know, bad detection. Yeah. The package is detected incorrectly, and the, the, users, the user's like, well, clearly it burns just wrong, and, well, the answer is, well, it's wrong, but it can it's only... In, because it couldn't tell your intent. It's, you know, it's completely reasonable in the way it interpreted it. It's just not matching your intent, and that's the problem. Or rather, I guess it assigned an intent to what it found, a.k.a. it must be a downgrade, and that's not the answer. So, And there have people that have hit this because they were using it as a product search. Anyway, so that's the problem with burn okay. and the upgrades, that one. Um, do we want to tackle 6176 today, or do you want to wait a little longer? I want <laughs> I want to get through these. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so what's, what's 6176? Oh, I should bring it up. 
this is designing how to convert v3 code oh how to so, convert v3 code mm. so you had custom table bootstrapper application data and that got split into two different concepts in v4 we now have unreal on custom table and we have separate elements for bootstrapper application data Mm -hmm. So what is Wix convert going to do when it sees bootstrapper application data equals yes? Is it going to try, is it going to convert it to Unreal? Which I think is what it's doing today. Or is it, does it need to convert that into the new element that you use for bootstrapper application data? Or does it just give up and say, this requires manual conversion? Because most of this stuff is linker stuff, so Wix convert is not going to be able to do much with it anyway, unless right, it's all self-contained. Because yeah, bootstrap application data is going to be way too far away from the actual rows it would have to convert, potentially far too far away, because that's on the definition of the table, right? Right. And so the actual usage of the rows could be in some other fragment, some other file or whatever. And Wix convert would have to be like, oh, you referred to this table and remember and cross scanning all these files. And it simply does not work that way. Um, and then on top of that, we created custom table ref in V4. Yeah. So um, like in V3, you would use custom table in both situations. Right. So really, conversion of custom table is not going to work very well at all. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, hmm. yeah, I, I don't, it's, <laughs> yeah, it could just be a, I'm trying to figure out, should we try to convert the bootstrap application data equals yes, the the definition to the new format or not? And then it's going to find its custom table is gone. I think we just have to work I think you're right. I think converting this automatically is not going to work out well. We have one other case of that so far, I think, in the QT exec or something, um, where it's just like, uh, we can't help you. Here's what you need to go figure out and do yourself. Um, or we can't do this for you. And this one may be the same. It's just a matter of then leaving them in a state that they can get to where they need to go. And I, I don't know which is better to leave the custom table there or to have converted the bootstrap application data to the new format, right? To at least get the definition of the new format. Does that make sense? As long as that was the intent and it, they weren't trying to create an unreal table. Oh, because you could use bootstrap application data, right? To create an unreal table. There's like a back door back into unreal table. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, we convert it to an Unreal table, and uh, they're not even going to look at the error. I mean, if we leave it alone, then it won't compile, and I'll force them to fix it. Yep. That, that's where I was, I was getting to that, or switch it to Unreal and leave the attribute. I, I don't know leave a marker that the compiler says, hey, um, this was converted. Did you really want this? If so, you need to do a manual step to remove this piece of data. And if you actually want to bootstrap application data, then you need to go read all of this stuff. I don't know if it's worth it. 
there aren't, I don't know how much this is used outside what we've done. Or with the NBA and such. Bob, do you have any gut feeling on this? Um... I, I f so I've I've been working on projects that have a lot of custom tables um, that aren't necessarily used for bootstrap replication data. So, but of course that was the option available in V3 to to add data, you know, to the to the output. Yeah, to the output. Yeah. Um. So I, you know, I, I don't, I, I would not. It would make me sad if we lost the ability to convert, um, to convert that kind of authoring. Um, that said, I recognize that you know, <laughs> it was kind of a hijack of, of uh, the bootstrapper application data attribute. So, yeah. Uh, I don't have strong feelings, no. Probably should just do whatever is easiest, which is just leave it alone. Probably. And just people are going to have to battle their way through it and be like, yeah, sorry. Sorry, we couldn't convert you there. Um, good luck. <laughs> I, mean, I, I guess we could add a setting saying, yeah, I want all mine to be bootstrap or application data. Or I want them all to be unreal. Yeah, the problem is that we're not even going to be able to get them there. We're not be able to get them to bootstrap application data, right? So it's only a partial help. It's only a partial that's list. Not, that's not true. Because if you if you tell the converter that all custom tables are bootstrap application data... Oh, you're saying then even if any... I, I see. So anytime we hit anything... Right. Any custom table, whether we have a definition for it or not, you just turn it into bootstrap application data. Oh, right, because you don't need the definition anymore for bootstrap application data, do you? You you still need a definition. It's It has the same usage as a custom table. It just right. has different names for the elements. But you have enough information in a custom table with rows to... Yeah, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. The only hard part was the intent. You do, you couldn't tell. The converter can't tell in the context it has what it's supposed to be. But if it knows what it's supposed to be, it knows how to convert it. Well, then maybe the switch is the way to go. And just don't mix and match your uses of Bootstrap application data in the same file. <laughs> Um, don't have both used to be Unreal and used to be a Bootstrap application, which is unlikely that you would do that anyway, because your Bootstrap application data would probably be as a, a bundle, and if you're using it as an Unreal table, it would be over with your MSI, and there you go. Um, that's not, yeah, that's not terrible. It gets Bob what he wants, and it gets people to their success state either way. They just have to have a little bit more knowledge of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I guess we could error if the switch isn't provided, too. So um, if if we hit a custom table and the switch isn't provided, spit out an error saying, hey, we hit one of these. We can't convert this. Um, you need to go back and tell us which way to convert these things by this command line switch. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Uh, it doesn't have to be preview zero, but it would be well, be nice. But um, yeah, I don't think this needs a whip. I think that would be fine. If it, I, I think Sean, you're right. I think that's the best way to go. It is not no, the I, easiest one to do. I got you to sign up for it. Are you gonna? <laughs> All right, keep fine. That assignment? <laughs> fine. Well, your name was still on it, so I was hoping I could jump off of it. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. That's fine. I think the switch is probably the way to go. I mean, I, I can do it, I guess. The, I'm the not real... short for issues to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I mean, the reason I got assigned to you because we were getting nowhere in emails about what to do about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes the emails, it just takes a while to figure out what things we're talking about. And yeah, this one, I, I, yep, 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 yep. No, you're, I think you're right. I think the switch is the way to go. And if we hit one, then basically say, uh, you need to provide the switch to tell us how to interpret this. And then the compiler can do, or the, the converter can do the right thing. And that's a reasonable solution. Because one, they're not common. I don't think they're common, which means most people will never even have to worry about this switch. And as soon as they hit one, it will immediately tell them to go look at this switch. And that'll put them in the right place to then figure out what to do. And the worst case is they're using both of them. They're using it in both ways in one file, which seems highly unlikely. Then they have to fix the file to split it. And then they're off to the races again. Okay. That's probably the way to go. Bob's tracking his issues as comments in the. Are these the two ones I've fixed already? Yes. There was history, so I wanted to pull it up. <clears throat> Unfortunately, your your link to the fix links to Codeplex. So <laughs> God. <laughs> that wasn't too helpful. <laughs> wow. All right. Um, well, you can. I put Codeplex up on GitHub, so I could edit that with the commit. Does it actually have it per commit? Yeah, there's per commit. In there. Okay, cool. Cool. So, Sean, uh, all right, let's put this in preview zero. We can take whip off. I don't think it needs a whip. Uh, put it in preview zero, and if my name stays on it, then I'm doing it. If your name, if if my name stays on it, then I will do it. We'll just do that, and then you can make your call. That way. Cool. Yep. Yeah. All right. Going back. Um, we're going to skip 4727 because that's not easy and that one's mine. Do you want to take a swing at 4991 real fast? Is it fast? We can we can move on if you want. I don't. That's going to be a really short or a really long. I don't know which. Um, and 5950, is that a really short, real long? I don't care about that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know why it's here, but I guess we'll talk about it on another. Well, okay. You don't care about... I mean, I don't care to discuss that today. I see. Got it. Uh, all right. And four nine, let's just take a quick look at 4991 then. Just maybe we can give you that back. 4991. Error and burn does not reach custom application. Really? I have a whip for this. So oh. the problem is, is when there's a related bundle and it's in the... It's in the it has a registry key, but it's not in the cache. So, oh, okay, wait. So, There's a related bundle. It's installed according to the registry key, but it's not present in the cache. Someone cleaned up the package cache and it's no longer yeah. there. Okay. Uh, registry registry cleaning. Okay. Oh, oh, okay, so we think the related bundle is still there, but it's not in the cache, so we can't do anything with it. Right. Uh, and then what, do we die in this case? I don't remember. I think the problem is, is that we can't uninstall it, so then right. when you un install the new one, you're going to have entries for both. Gotcha. Yeah, for the customer shop, I should detect a problem act on it. Um, except if you, yes, and one of the, so in the end, we couldn't upgrade. And so one of those um, ARP entries is busted, right? So if you click on the wrong one, if you click on it and you go to add new programs and you say uninstall or anything, the ARP will say, Hey, there's no XE. The XE that this thing points at isn't here. Do you want to remove this entry? That's what. That's the end, right? That's the end result of this. Yeah. <laughs> Except the bundle's contents are still installed. Yeah. I, or, or yeah, whatever. Depending Presumably. on what the cleaner did. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right. Right. Um. Okay. I see that. Um, do I need to go find the whip? Um, 
Yeah. What's the proposal? So there's two parts. One proposal is to go ahead and tell the BA, yeah, there's this related bundle here, but it's not in the cache. Yeah, but what are they going to do with that? So the second part of the proposal is make burn add the hash and size of the bundle when it registers. And then you can author a download URL so that no. it can go grab the bundle as part of wow. un uninstalling. Um, that's cool. Do you really want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, really? Like, the user I mean, messed that's... up their machine. We couldn't upgrade because it's not there. The end result is two ARP entries, and if you click on one of them, it says, hey, this was prematurely removed, or this, you know, it doesn't exist anymore, and it goes away. That's, I mean, that's not a... But it does still leave the, the whole bundles stuff on the machine. Yeah, we can't... <laughs> I mean, yeah. The, 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 no, 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 I'm just, I'm just saying the, the, you know, the ARP mitigation is, is not a great oh, one. okay, that's fine. Fine, fine, fine. You're right. So... Right. Do people really want to block if they can't find this, though? Well, the BSI's I mean, may have been upgraded. If it was important, well, maybe, but it maybe. depends on the I, I know, Totally, plan. totally, right. But if the BA could just say, hey, this didn't work, go go grab version N, which the BA could know, right, because that's reported yep. Um, yep. from this download area, and yep. reinstall it, that'll recache basically a no-op other than recaching. Yep. And then everything's hunky-dory. Yep. So I think the error, sending an error is reasonable. I don't know that we should do all the extra stuff. I mean, it, I'm, it's cool, but I think it's a bit uh, one step too far kind of thing. Because there may be multiple related bundles that you're upgrading, right? There could be N of them. So you'd have to have hashes for all of them and download URLs for all of them as opposed to a generic RS message that says, uh, go back to our website, find this version, and download it. And whether it's on the website or not, or whatever, is, you know, turns into a support ticket. But there you go. Well, I think you missed... So the original bundle is authored with a download URL. When you install the original bundle... It, it writes its information up here. It writes its information up there. You don't author it in the bundle that's running. No, that you're right. That doesn't make any sense. You're right. That's a better way of doing it. Um, I mean, I think it's cool. I think it, 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 honestly, you know what? It's, uh, the new author that, so the bundle has a URL burned into it to know where it came from or where to go get it again, essentially. Yeah. The bundle has its own, this is where I come from. Um, do we have something for that now? I don't think. We don't. Yeah. No, I mean, it's de deeply related to, you know, uh, update feeds, but... Yeah, it's really hard sometimes to provide that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how feasible this is for you to provide the download URL when you built the bundle. Yeah, I, I think the one that Bob said is probably more realistic, generally more realistic. I mean, it's cool to be able to say, yeah, here's your, if you know the download URL, then we're, you're all hunky-dory, we'll, you know, you provide lots of information. Versus the, um, hey, uh, you had this previous version. Go, we can't find it. I think that's the, really, that might be the 80, 90% case. Here's an error message. We were going to remove the pseudo bundle because it was upgraded. Here was all the information we had for it. Go tell the user what you want to do with it, essentially. right? So they can have a friendly name. And like Bob said, they can throw an error message up if they want that says, hey, your previous version was corrupt. We don't want to upgrade lest we, you know, screw up the upgrades. So why don't you go and find this version and, you know, on our website at, you know, www.example.com and we will, of course, everyone's going to use a search engine, um, and then get, install that and then come back and repair this. And that's your paragraph dialogue error message that Bob would have to fix all the wording on if that was actually in our product. Um, no. Um, and, and actually, I'd point out, other than the fact that you want to bake the URL into the previous bundle, 
a BA could do this by itself. Yes. Exactly. Right. The uh, typically typically no. the URL typically the URL is known, right? Because it's 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 you know it's some predictable path based on you know an based on Azure Blob storage or an S3 bucket slash product slash version slash right. whatever. So a bundle a bundle could do this. It would have to have some additional knowledge baked in, but Oh, the, you're saying a BA could do all of it with just providing the version of the old one. It's like here's your old version. Go figure out. It it might require some extra data to come in, Correct. but the engine isn't in a privileged position other than um other than knowing the hash. Mm -hmm. Actually, oh, it does. Uh, wait, is the hash in the unsaw key? Not today. That's part of this proposal is to write oh. the hash in the file size yeah. to the uninstall key. Yeah. It's not in there today, but it could be. Well, there you go. Then, in th then in that case, definitely the engine is not at all privileged if that data is available to it, it would be available to the BA as well, and the BA could could manage the download. Well, if we want to put in the ARP key, the old bundle has to do it, so burn has to be part of that. But yeah, sorry, I, uh, sorry. Yes, well, that's I'm I'm I guess I'm adding a proposal, notification mitigation, uh, data writing. They don't pick me for words all the time, uh, so the engine would would you know do the on detect related bundle callback with extra data and write i guess it's really the only thing it's going to know for sure is hash and size right it already writes version mm -hmm. yeah yeah in that case the ba could then do everything the download doesn't have to be part of the engine but it would avoid a UAC prompt if you can involve the engine. That is true. Yeah, I don't... I hear you. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yes, true. But it's an honestly, exceptional case. I, so I don't, I'm, exactly. I'm I don't know that I want to get involved in this. I don't want to get deeply involved in this. I, I, I like the idea of... I like what you've proposed here, or the idea of being, hey, um, we found this. We're supposed to be upgrading this, and by the way, it's missing. You you might want to do something about that, and then be done with it, and, and provide them as much information as we have about the related bundle. So storing the the file size and the hash, just as more information to give them here, I'm totally fine with that. But I'd always give it right. I'd just be like, hey, we stored a whole bunch of stuff in the ARP key. Here you go. Look what we detected. And by the way, the file's missing from disk. So you might want to do something about that. Um, I think that's totally, totally reasonable. I I don't think the hash and file size are, are very useful if the engine is not handling it. Because that needs to be the stripped down bundle. Oh, oh yeah. that's true. Then you're right. Yeah. Then then so, I would then then we already have basically yeah. give them everything and just I, the part we're missing is, hey, by the way, um, this file, <laughs> this thing's missing. <laughs> by the way, we detected it. We detected that you should have it, but you don't. So things aren't going to work out. And then the only question I'd have is, should it come back in on detect related, or should it come back as a separate error callback because it's kind of an error situation? But mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, it could also come back as its cache state. You know, like is it absent? Um, installed or cached or whatever. I mean, you could reuse that state. I'm, I'm not saying should, I'm just saying could. I don't uh, think we normally communicate the cache state for anything. Really? But we, it's highest state, I guess. That's what we would communicate, right? Right. Yeah. We detect this related bundle. It's not installed, but we're not doing it installed, but it, it would be installed. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Uh, so I, I don't have a strong feeling whether it should be more information added to on-detect related bundles that you can tell when you're in this state versus a separate callback that says, hey, by the way, you're in an error state that we're not going to be able to deal with this related bundle. Um, 
I like localizing it to Hunter Tech related bundle, but I don't have a strong feeling either. I mean, I th I would rather not have to add a new one. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's that's we fair. have enough already. <laughs> the only challenge is we're hiding an error code, technically speaking, in here, but that's the only the only thing. But well, other callbacks get HRs. Yeah, but it's not an error either. So. Yeah, I'm fine with just doing the notification. Yeah, I, it's I think a lot easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think everything else is just going. Uh, we're being too helpful and getting too involved in this situation that generally should not happen. And I'm don't, happen. I don't want to get sucked into people like that. <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah, you know, mm -mm, no, we'll let you know that you're crazy and then we're not getting involved, right? It's just, nope, stop there. So I think that's the way to do that one, which is the easier part of all this, presumably. Yep. And cool. we'll, and we'll resolve this, the error that it does not reach the custom bootstrap application. They will now be able to display an error should they choose to interpret this missing related bundle as an error which arguably it will be because we're going to skip it in the end or the net result is going to get skipped because pseudo bundles are optional right so they don't fail the install right yep woohoo you so said you don't Sean, want to... I should be giving you 4991 uh, sure alright and you don't want to do 5950 so we're going to move on yep alright cool um 4727 is going to be an interesting conversation um, when we get to that. So I will probably should prep it with some content anyway. Definitely not today. Okay. Um, language design. All right. Repo reorganization. So um, if you're not doing active development in Wix 4, a lot of this conversation isn't going to make sense or may or may not be interesting to you. If you are it doing might active, not be interesting or make sense that even if you are. Um, or if you are doing development, namely Sean and Bob, they've been having critical feedback about the repo reorganization we did, um, which was, I would say, not unexpected and been kind of sitting there. Right, at some point, we need to address this because the goal is not to enact pain on people as we're going through this. Um, so in Wix, we went to micro re in Wix 4 at the beginning, we went to micro repos, um, hoping to separate out um, a lot of separation of concerns in the Wix tool set to make it easier to develop um, uh, targeted chunks of the Wix tool set or, and or also to release targeted chunks of the Wix tool set by clearly, clearly defining the uh, boundaries between functionality so that things were not blurred, which we had a, uh, we did a lot in Wix 3 where everything was all kind of glommed together. So it, things got really blurred all the time. Common.cs is an example of one example where that got really blurry. Um, and, and also to reduce the size of operating on the Wix tool set, for example, with all of the extensions in the Wix tool set, there's just a large block of stuff that if you were just wanting to work on one particular area, you ended up pulling in all of that other stuff. The downside, which is the same downside that hit the ASP.NET Core team when they did this, and I was appropriately warned um, by people on the .NET Core team about um, over uh, micro repo repository, that's not correct, micro-organizing your repositories, making them too small um, is that the overhead of moving stuff between them becomes a problem. And both Sean and Bob have been noting that overhead. So the question I wanted to put was to at least we should have a discussion because we haven't had a discussion. I've, I've heard the, the grumblings and I totally appreciate them. I felt them. I do, I just wanna kind of work through the where we're at, what we can do and how far we should go to, do we just put everything back in one repo and do all that? Or can we save some of the goals that I had for repo reorganization and make life um, better? Um, 
at this at this time and all those kinds of things. The last thing I'm going to throw on top of this is that um, AppVare GitHub has now introduced GitHub Actions. They are a build system built into GitHub. They're no better, no worse than any other um, CI system at, that takes YAML as its input and does all of its build stuff. And they have all the features that we need to build the Wix tool set. And I have, as of late, um, been dealing with 15 minute waits on uh, the AppVare builds in a number of my PRs, which with the micro repos makes things a little more frustrating when you're waiting for one repo to finish as you're rolling through all these things. Um, and I don't say anything. I mean, I, I feel for AppVare, they're, we're using the resources for free. We're using a lot of the resources as we do lots of PRs. Um, so I don't feel like <laughs> We're, we're not helping them <laughs> in their survival battle against Microsoft with two different CI systems in the Windows build arena. Um, so part of it's like, maybe we just move to GitHub Actions. The reason that I'm bringing this up now is, um, one, I've been wanting to, but I've been too buried behind other things. And the second is that I'm looking at a couple of uh, my preview zero issues, for example, signing, that's going to require me to go through and touch and do blocks of work to every repo. So if we are to make these larger structural changes, um, I would do them because I did the first one, so I would undo the damage that I did <laughs> if, if that's the direction we decided to go. And I would be doing all these moves um, to get us, because I have to go and touch everything anyway. So I wanted to start there. I, I've kind of grouped the set of repositories. This isn't all of them. Um, but I've kind of grouped the big ones that get used, you know, all over the place into these uh, four chunks of things of where we have the utils, which is dutil, WCA util, and DTF, small repositories that when you change them, there are lots of repositories that depend on them. Um, but that's just fundamentally true about these things. Um, the next one is the, what I called core, because I don't have a better name for it, which is the data extensibility, the core native, Core native is the native functionality for the core tool set. Then the core repository, which is the implementation of the front ends and back ends and uh, all that, uh, the converters and the tools where the Wix XE actually gets built and the MS build stuff actually gets built. Then there are the extensions where there are the many, many extensions we have. I forgot how many, I didn't count them all, um, at least 10 um, that do all the different functionality that the Wix tool set provides above and beyond what the Windows installer provides. Um, and those are relatively self-contained, save util, and I have hopes that we're gonna be able to fix the util problem at some point so that none of the extensions have any dependencies on each other, but util as a dumping ground. Currently things have dependencies on it and then go down from there. And then there's burn, which is broken into the burn repository, the ball util, and the ball Wix extension. I pulled the ball Wix extension separate from the other extensions, mostly because it depends on burn and it has a lot more uh, functionality in it than the typical extension, where a typical extension is like just, you know, the compiler or whatever, and then some custom actions, where the ball Wix extension has all the host, the native hosts, and DNC host, and MBA host, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a bit more of a beefy um, uh, repository. And there's, there's, there's a few others floating around, but these are the ones that are like kind of the big ones in the middle. Um, and so where I was at before was the, I wanted the ability to release fixes without being required to release the whole world again, like we do with the Wix tool set today. And we can do that because everything in its own repository, built its own NuGet package, can be released independently. But like in core, maybe that's overboard because it's unlikely that you're going to release a data that doesn't end up having to have the core being rebuilt and then that you're going to release a change to core that doesn't need the tools rebuilt. So there's those. And then burn. Sean, you've been operating independently in there, and I don't have a good experience across those, although I, I can see how, especially when you get to like some integration scenarios, that having them all separate like that and separate from the tools makes burn very challenging to 
validate changes across all those um, repositories. Yeah, there's there's multiple dependencies like burn. If you make a change in burn, you gotta go update core to pull in the new burn. But then you have to go to ball util and ball wix extension, and the wix extension needs to pull in the latest burn and the latest core or tools really to make sure you get all the changes there. Yep. Yep. So that's going to be the hardest one really is because I mean technically the integration repo should be in there too. And then Yeah, I didn't know where to stick that one, but yes. So like if you make a change in burn repo, you'll you and you change like a BA message or something, you're going to end up having to touch core tools while util, while wake extension and, and integration. And you're kind of having to go back and forth between your categories here. Yep. Burn and then core and then back to burn. Yeah. And that was the goal was to not have that sort of thing happen. Um, that cyclic cyclical things were going to be bad. And when the repo reorganization happened, um, the hope was that burn would be a fairly would be more of an island and it's not worked out that way as much. Now at a certain level I do think we could cut I don't think core needs to be dependent on burn. Tools could be dependent on burn, but that doesn't move the issue significantly. No, because you're wanna always have core and tools in the same repo anyway. Yeah, if they go in the same well, yes. And and there's still the idea of like does tools live separately as the I mean Tools is kind of also the release point. It's like the last one, it brings everything together, and then that's where the the big releases come out of. Um, but the fact that the extensions depend on it means it didn't work out exactly as well as I hoped it would, um, because you end up having to update the tools and then update the extensions if there's a change that needs to come down. So there is that. Um, so, so it's really the, the extensions are really the only ones that can be released independently. Anything else you touch really should, you're going to have to build all the upstream dependencies. Like if you touch deutil, you really should rebuild like everything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, yes, it depends on how we want to look at Deutil, right? It's like, yes, if you make this change in Deutil, we have to go and update everything, or Deutil has to not have breaking changes, or which, is, and, and I'm going to say this, that when Deutil doesn't have breaking changes, it needs to think about its breaking changes so that when people pick up a new drop, they can pick it up. So that means that they, they can pick it up without having a gob of things fail on them, um, but that means that versions of deutil that have been published are all independent of each other. Therefore, you should be able to pick any of those deutils and only pick up a newer one if you want to, as opposed to being you have to pick up a new deutil. Okay, you pick up a new deutil when it has something you want in it. That works better when it's stable. It doesn't work real well when, for example, if you're changing deutil regularly, then you have a lot of things that have to go get updated to take advantage of that potential fix. Um, that is absolutely a downside right now. The system does not optimize for that. Now, the util has not been a huge problem. It has been a problem when any time that we've had one changes, I'm thinking of the size T thing that rippled all over the place. That, for example, was not a, that was a, the perfect example of a thing that was going to break everything, and you had to go run it all the way through the whole system. But there are other changes to the util that don't have to be run to everybody, because the util has so many different things in it. Um, and it has been relatively okay, but it's also been relatively pretty stable in general. There haven't been a lot of changes to DU comparatively, um, as opposed to pretty much all the other, <laughs> all these other, well, anything not in utils. Utils has, all those things in that first bullet have been relatively stable, just because we're not doing work in them. Um, there hasn't been a lot well, of work to do them. That, that's true, and, but that's the difference between DUtil and, say, util Wix extension, right? Yes. They're both dumping grounds. Yes, and they get used everywhere. So, yes. you know, util util Wix extent extension is used by other extensions. Yes, and 
you know, so they they have the same problem of needing to to spread. Um, but diutil, like you said, is stable, and when it becomes unstable, like you know, doing something big in thimutil, for example, yeah. it doesn't matter except for fall Wix extension, right? Where Wix standard bay lives, right? Yep. So that's why I, we haven't been having huge issues with the UWCO DTF thus far. I mean, I guess the point is also true with data right now while we're still working on it. Yes. No, it's data is an example of something that's painful when you update it. It ripples all over the place and it creates all those problems. And and it's the worst case because we are actively working on it. In fact, we're talking about adding section IDs to it and redoing the way that payload or package refs and pay, uh, payload refs are referenced. And it's like, yeah. But I, I I expected that pain. I knew that pain. I was prepared for that level of pain. Um, I was. I, I was mentally that. But I know that I'm inflicting on other people, and you guys are not feeling happy with it. So I'm like, all right, so maybe we bring it in. One... But at the same time, and and at the same time, I thought there was going to be value in having data be able to be released once and not be released again, so that when we f did finish data, it would be kind of like the util. It doesn't change very often, so it could be a standalone and useful standalone assembly that can read all the file formats that Wix spits out. Right. And it doesn't rev constantly because if we put it in, for example, with tools, every time there's a change to core for something or there's a change to burn for something, then that would mean that if it was built at the same time, data would be revved even though data has no change. And thus there would be these set of scenarios that would be impacted even though data was not impacted. So the whole Okay, but now, now you're talking about two different things, though. One is is – you know, source organization, repo organization, but the other is is publishing Correct. or promotion. You're right. So the, you can build. We could have a mono repo with everything in it, even the extensions, and control our publishing and our promotion, such that you know data isn't quote unquote released until there's a change that requires it. Right. Today, you can do that with monorepos. You don't check something in unless it's something you want published. Um, but given that we're, we're talking about repos and not delivery mechanisms, today that would be NuGet packages, Yep. Um, publishing isn't tied to the, the repo organization. You're absolutely right. Which, Thank you. Fantastic. Better segue than I could have provided to the next point of if we combine them, my concern then is that, yes, they could release at different times. I, can we put the um, safeguards in place to enable that to happen? So, for example, my concern is if data lived inside uh, all with all the other core things here, all the other things on that second bullet point together, and then we did a build, we wouldn't want like wixtoolset.core.dll to have a dependency on wixtoolset.data.dll that we don't plan to publish or that is not already published, right? We don't want to have it rebuild data, have potentially new changes in it, then that isn't published with core. So right. we end up- What's with wrong with publishing a new version of data every time? It's going to rev the file form. It's, it's going to pick up changes that aren't real, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm, con I, I'm, Data is less interesting. Maybe extensibility is better. Like the better story. Yeah, a better story, and also data gets used in the uh, behind extensibility. Extensibility uses data. Um, every publish of the core of the bullet point core here. I should have named something else. I just didn't come up with a better name when I was trying to write this slide. Everything of that second bullet point. If extensibility revs every time, then technically speaking, all the extensions need to be revved when extensibility changes. Why? Right. Be, or it's going to at least look like it. All the extensions are going to be at different well, version of sensibility and trying to, like, having... I mean, it, I guess that's the point I was trying to make before. Like, yes, that should happen totally. If you... Every time you touch extensibility, you should rebuild all the extensions. Well, but we're not just talking about... Yeah, but, I, no, but not every time you touch burn or core. 
or tools, you should not have to be rebuilt all the extensions. And technically, we haven't touched it. It just got rebuilt. It got caught up in the, the torrent of right. of rebuilding that happens in a mono or less than micro repo. Right. Mini repo. So what's what goes wrong if you increase if you increase extensibility but you don't rebuild the extensions? Hopefully nothing. Yeah. But an extension author has no way of knowing that without looking at what happened with extensibility. Maybe there was a critical security fix. That's not a breaking change. So according to Semver, we don't change the major. It's not a new feature. We don't change the minor. It just gets a bump, which is kind of what happens you know, today for CI builds. But right. there's no way of knowing. And if they, they, you know, if they're using wildcard versions on their package references, they would get picked up. My expectation is that when we get later, like after we release, that data and extensibility will not change. There's going to be, they're just going to be harder. They're going to be hard to change no matter what. But burn, we'll continue to do things in burn. Burn has, you know, bug fixes. It lives in the outside world. It's a pain in the ass to, it has to deal with the pain in the ass that is the outside world. So it continues to get fixes. Um, the core tool set the same way. It, it has a lot of machinery in it, and it will continue to get fixes. Um, that have um, no impact, that do not require changes to data and extensibility. For example, I expect to go through a very interesting and long uh, series of bugs on patching. It's just going to happen. But data and extensibility don't change, and nor do the extensions. And so we're, when we get to release point, I think we see fixes in core and burn, and then and not fixes in data extensibility or other things. And I don't want to force all the extensions to rev because we're fixing bugs in core or burn or whatever. I mean, I guess the easiest thing to do probably would have been to keep everything together until we're ready to release and then split it up at the end. That, that's entirely possible, except I was very concerned because I came from Wix 3 of not being able to do that. Like, by having the separation, so for me, as I've been trying to separate parts and see where the lines need to be in the in the Wix tool set, which was not at all visible before, it was just one big ball of mud, these boundaries have helped me see that. So again, I've been getting the benefit out of it, thus I've not been uh, as upset about the, or having as many challenges. I've been getting the benefit out of it, so I, the pain is tolerable, <laughs> I guess. It's like, I understand why I'm paying the pain. You guys are just getting the pain because the architectural separation of these things has been um, less of a problem, right? And burn, I'm not even sure we've architecture separated those assemblies or those repos properly right now. Um, like I haven't even thought about, like maybe ball util and burn should live together, for example. Um, and I've toyed with the idea that maybe the back end of the core should live out with burn. The burn back end should not live in core, but it should live in burn. Maybe that would solve problems. I don't know that it would, but yeah, those kind of things. But architecture has helped me see these things. Now that I feel like I have the layers in my head well enough, bringing them back together, I could see it being, I could see it being done. If we could figure out the idea of, um, and if we could try to solve the thing that I'm worried about of rebuilding data or sensibility um, when there's no changes to them. I guess well, so I, the other I thing I, to, I was just trying ahead. to say in hindsight that's what the easiest thing to would be, would have been to do. I, I I know what you're saying. I just don't know if I could have gotten here do, doing that. In the core, like I. In the core, I don't know if I could have separated it as well. But yeah. Uh, so the other thing to talk about in regarding publishing and promotion is. Today, we're used to everything being on the at bear nougat feeds, um, but generally, people are outside of the three of us are going to be picking up these packages via, say, nougat.org. Yes. That's, that's an opportunity there for us to insert process of some sort to control the promotion of something from you know, just being a CI build 
to being well promoted promoted yeah on your org for others to consume you are absolutely correct um, but that and yes and i hope that that gives us opportunities to do the right things in in picking the right parts i'm still worried about core having a dependency on a higher sensibility even though sensibility didn't change so that's the i think yeah if i could if i could solve that problem if i could get that unwound in my head and make it say oh okay here's a very simple way or very simple, uh, a very safe way I, I i'm i'm even okay with if we can get the complicated thing done one time right but a very safe way that doesn't have lots of overhead to maintain it to run it um that would be good for example one thing i've thought about and i think and i haven't dug deep into it but asp.net core it looks like what they did with their micro repos is they brought them into one repo but they kept each of their micro repos as a top level directory in there yeah and yeah. then each of those are running as separate projects and there's not one master uh build across the top necessarily i don't know if that's exactly true but that does allow things there are different projects to run at different speeds Right, and it could be an option, which is one of the the pain points I know that Sean and I have both run into is that you, when you make a change in data, you need to rebuild the world, and right now it's tough to rebuild the world. Yeah. Um, now one one option is to continue to share via something like NuGet packages uh, to enforce the versioning that you're you're talking about. So data extensibility and core can all live together, but the dependencies can still be expressed via NuGet packages. It doesn't address the, the build the world scenario, but it addresses the separation is a big deal scenario. Right, it gives you one repo. You can commit once across all those things, then you just have to make sure the build order happens. Correctly, well, and and to be clear, the build, you know, it, it's 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 not really it's not complicating things. It's complicating things compared to a ball of mod, mono repo, right? Today, again, we use the repos to enforce yep. the separation and to enforce the the, the versioning. Yep. Um, if we want to bring stuff together, we can still do that, but it's going to it's going to take work on the build side of things rather than on the repo side of things. Um, yeah. So for example, say data extensibility and core are separate projects. They need to be able to talk to each other, both for the purposes of, of build the world and for the purposes of saying, Oh yeah, extensibility didn't change. So let's keep, you know, keep using that, you know, the old version of extensibility, even if we're rebuilding it. Yeah, that part. Yeah. Even if we're rebuilding, it still use the old one. Or, or, keep, well, again, build the world is an important thing. Uh, you know, we have, we have to be able to do that. Now, maybe that's as simple as saying, uh, okay, you know, at the root, here's a traversal project that goes into all of the, the top level directories that used to be their own repos and, you know, builds them. Yeah, you know, to to be left as an exercise to the reader is how do how do you you know share the output? You know. Uh, okay. All right. Let me. I I enough stuff's kind of forming my head. Give me a minute. I want to pin something because I have some questions that I don't know the answers to um, on that. Because I, you've said some things there, Bob, that I'm going to let just sit for a second because I things are starting. Ideas are starting to happen, but I, they're not formed. So I have to say anything about it. Okay. Um. I'm going to start at one. I I I, I don't know. To start at the end, I like the idea that the extensions are in their separate repos. It's a pain in the ass sometimes, most of the time, when you need do need to update across all of them. But I like that they're separate mostly because I want to make them so that people can get into them and not into have to get into anything else if they want to go fix something in just one of those extensions. That's a great goal because we've had complaints in the past that it's a, it should be a simple change, but you know, there's all this overhead to building the rest of Wix problem is I don't think that's true anymore. And the biggest complication has always been the mix of native and managed code. 
and all the extensions have that. So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm. So I was generally in favor of separating out the extensions, in part, you know, for the reason you said. Also, because if you're working in core or burn, the extensions probably aren't changing, but you got to build them. Mm-hmm. That's that's what happens in a ball of mud mono repo. Mm-hmm. But as we're talking, we have things we have to do. Um, one of the things we can do is, to, like today, everything if everything is still via consume via NuGet packages, you can have extensions that are quote unquote built. And, but you know, it basically just turns into downloading a NuGet package. And we're talking about again separate projects, so you can still say, "Oh, I'm just going to work in core. I don't need to build the rest." Part of it is, you know, the output of Wix4, the Wix4 build is NuGet packages, not a bundle, right? So we kind of already solved the problem of of you know, the 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 pain, some of the pain of building everything in a big ball of mud. Um, we just don't, you don't have to worry about the things you don't so, care about. So if we went to the ASP.NET core model and we brought all of the existing projects into a single repo where each of the current repos are top level folders mm-hmm. in our building, would you bring extensions into that one repo or would you keep them separate? Um, weekly together. I think. Well, I mean, weekly. Well, how, would, how would my integration tests work? Well, we have we have to solve. So the problem we have right now, as you point out in the README on the integration repo, is that because we're using NuGet, there's a whole world of pain when you want to do stuff locally that isn't published in a NuGet feed, right? Um, that's a problem we'd have to solve in if we want to support a a you know let's build the world scenario. Which and you know backing up the build the world scenario for me is look I want to I want to make a change and I want to build every damn thing clean and run all of the tests. You know if you're working at a certain layer you want to be able to to do that across the world and that's the reason I would weekly support moving the extensions in because being able to make all those changes and test them is just, it, it gets so much harder outside of, uh, it gets, it gets harder because we're sharing via NuGet packages. Um, so yeah, solving that problem is, I think the only way this works. Right. So, Sean, if we brought in, if we created the, if we, if we destroyed the Wix4 repo and brought it back um, afresh, if we got the Wix4 repo afresh and then took all of our various repos today and made them the root directories in there, uh, in that Wix4 repo, and then integration would live at the top of that. Um, I wonder if integration could be a special repo that just said, you know what, I'm going to create direct project references across the world just because I feel like reaching in and grabbing the latest code from everything. Um, or maybe well, the challenge is we need like tools. We need the, we need the, the, um, the aggregating repos that we have like tools. Tools would be there in that repo. So it would be able to take a dependency straight on tools. As long as it's, you know, a whole transitive dependency chain, yeah, that's yeah. fine. That's that's going to work. So that that so that's when we were talking. That was kind of the thing I was going. Is what if there's a way of saying a project can build with its transitive? Like it's like I'm going to reach straight in and grab data for my latest, and then also be built in the more. No, I'm going to build in the more closed method. Um, where I'm going to take a dependency on a NuGet package and build with that. Um, mm-hmm. If we can come up with a, a toggle that doesn't mess things up. Yeah. Or yeah. that if you mess it up as a developer, right, and you, you toggle and you're like, I'm going to build against everything, and then you push core before pushing data, and you didn't notice, right, or whatever, then 
um, it would break. It would, the build would fail, and you would not move forward, and that would be okay. You'd be like, oh, 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 right, that's fine. It caught that. It caught that. Um, but you would be able to yeah. do development normally, and it would not be. Um, it would not be worse than where we're at today, and maybe it could be better. If integration could do the same thing, where it's like, hey, I just want to reach in and grab everything all the time, integration could be the latest of everything, um, which may not be exactly what we're shipping, because it would be the latest of everything, but it certainly would test everything, to all the latest code together. Yeah, and we definitely have, this has to be a toggle. It has to be easy, and this is where I love the idea of being able to do this with the integration repo, um, cause again, you know, you want to, you want it to be easy to build the world when you're making changes at, at, you know, lower layers. Um, but yeah, you, you want to make sure that, um, everything still works without pushing, um, you know, uh, an updated extensibility package, for example, because that's the, um, that's what, that's how we decide for sure. Um, whether we can promote another package, mm-hmm. right? I mean, obviously, if you're sitting there looking at your your stage changes in Git, you go, "Oh, I touch data." Okay, well, probably I'm going to have to promote a new data. Well, how? Yeah, I how... mean, you'd have to. You would have to stop doing this. Um... We're going to push a breaking change, but not fix the extensions. Like, that wouldn't work anymore. That's why I want build the world. And that's where a monorepo excels, right? Yes, we have to make these changes. I don't want to do 18 different commits. If, if I can build the world, I can see all my breaking changes. I can fix them all. You know, probably it's going to be, you know, easier to update um, references. Yeah, you may have to do two pull requests, one to upstate extensibility and then one that updates all the extensions. Right, yeah. you, have to, you have to push extensibility, that's, that's, get it built clean, and right, then right. you could push the rest, everything downstream from that, you could push in one PR. Yeah. And well, then they would all. Now, it might actually that kind be of three. takes away all the value of one repo if you have, you're still making me push multiple pull requests. Well, you it would cut down. Well, you you would be able to cut down to your upstream. It depends on how many upstream things you have, right? So you could, if you change data extensibility, then you have to do three commits, right? Because you have to do data and then extensibility to pick up the new data, and then everything else after that you can do with one PR. Versus today, where you have to go core and then count extensions. <laughs> so it's better in that way, but it's not good. Now in burn, I don't have the dependencies set, so your counts are different than the ones that I know better in core. Um, if you make a change in burn, how many do you, like, is burn the top, and then ball util, and then ball extension? Are they all like that? Like, yes. each of them have a separate... So maybe they but, need to join. Maybe they just join. But... If you make a real like, if you make a change in burn that requires authoring changes, you're gonna to have to do burn core tools on one branch and burn ball util ball extension on a, a separate branch, and that ball extension requ- is requires the other branch to complete. This is yeah. mostly an issue because we need to because we need to update these dependencies. Um, but that's primarily an artifact of the fact that ugh, artifact of the fact that we need to make a change, get a built NuGet package, promote it, and then consume it. Correct. I mean, the that's easiest. I think not, it would I mean, be easier that's, that's, to have go back to a world where everything depends on latest, and then once right. we get ready to freeze things, we pull them out of the repo. And then that's where we start getting NuGet dependencies again. Or well, but we can also depend on latest NuGet packages because the, okay, so backing up, um, 
if the Wix bill depends on the <laughs> last known good build of certain packages like extensibility and data, then the promotion of of those packages from the CI build to the official feed is what currently we're doing by, you know, updating global.json or updating package refs. At that point, if we're promote if the promotion happens separately, then the then the the promotion uh, if the promotion happens separately, we don't need to make changes in the code. We don't it doesn't require a commit. It just I mean, requires I don't see the promotion. The point in trying to publish things separately until we start freezing things. Like where's the point in spending effort in trying to get things depending on old versions of things right now? There, I, I, yeah, I, there's I not actually, a lot right now, only in only in preparing for the future that that we will be able to, to do it. Yeah, we. That, I think we that I think have that, muscle memory for it. I, 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 Sean, you're right that you, that's we are operating in a late game and paying for the price in the early game, um, and we just have to be prepared to be able to handle the late game or know how to do it. So, um, if we build the world today then later on we need to be able to we need to be able to not build the world with the right. muscle memory like Bob's saying and so on and so forth and then I think theoretically we could have the build build to a local folder have every yeah. project reference have a wildcard reference like we do today and then hopefully the build would just pick up the NuGet package that was just built and then we, and we that's have actually wild card how, dependencies today, and then eventually it'll go to numbers once we start publishing for real. But we could also do we could we could use that same technique to let you fix a version, right? You could you could use that local folder to pull in, you know, an official NuGet package and plop it in the the right spot so that. Um, again, using a mechanism I have yet to identify, you can have the build look for package. Uh, have to figure out versioning. If you could figure out versioning, then it would. There, there's a you know a fairly. It's really s straightforward at the top level to lock your your build to whatever you're using. Um, whatever you want to use, you can you can have it so that you can build data and plop it into this, you know, packages mm. directory. Part of this is, mm. is the, the new NuGet model of using the cache is is kind of wrong. If you had a packages directory that you managed, you could do this. But Again, can... you have to fix versions. Mm. If you can get if you can get the package versions right, you can say, look, go use the data in this directory. We have again. We have to figure out versions because the published one is going to be, you know, 4.0.100, and your local one is going to be, you know, 4.0.200 plus hash. But if you could figure that out, then yeah, you, you just your build process. Again, there's some top-level thing that's got to control this. Your build process could say, okay, build data, put it in, put it in the packages folder. Therefore, I'm using the latest data when I'm working in core. All right, so I, I'm so one thing I'm hearing is the consolidating of all of the repos into one Wix4 repo, um, and top-level folders will probably be okay um, if we can get the build the the burn cycle worked out. Because I think it's the worst case that, and I probably it's the one I've, yeah. it's the one I have the least experience with. So a part of it is I need to go through that a couple times and get a feel for that. Um, because I think Sean is probably living the worst case scenario. It's kind of like um, extensions, and it's like that plus all the extension problems. Um, so, so 
So, but I, that's what I'm hearing, right? It, the idea of keeping extensions separate as separate repositories is less of an issue thing. The idea of being able to say, if someone wants to fix extension bugs, like, well, get into Wix 4, it's a big download, just sync it, just wait, and then go into the right folder for the extension you want to work on, ignore everything else for most part, and someone should be able to do that, right? So that's that's kind of the, the idea, bring everything to one, and then go work in the appropriate folder thing you want to do. Yeah, I think so. Sean? Yeah. Okay. So there's that. So then the next thing is there's something in here that I, we've not fixed and Bob's hand-waving at the, the, the magical <laughs> feature that either allows us to switch so that we can build everything against package references um, and switch that on and off appropriately in the dev mode or the model like what Sean's talking, which is more of a um, build everything to like a pool a, a NuGet, build up NuGet package to a pool and then have everything depend on those um, downstream and then we can start figuring out how to lock down what things end up in the pool, which may work as well if we can get that lock experience to be straightforward so that we don't have to, um, so that we, we don't have to remember how to do it or it's not hard to do so we can yeah. always get ourselves into that because that will come late. We won't do it normally, but at the end when we do, we want to make sure we can pull it off. Also, we want to be able to figure out how to, if we go that model, how to unlock something because we need to fix data, right. heaven forbid. You have to fix data, which then is going to unlock, I guess, everything. And then lock I mean, again. the lock? The lock should just be turning it from a wildcard to an explicit version. It could be. Maybe. Then we have to it go could be. I mean, sweep the whole repo for anybody that refers to that. Um, I don't know. I, Maybe, yeah. I mean, in in, in my script. head, we need some <laughs> top level build tooling that that control that makes this feature that makes this idea work. Yeah, but it, it's 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 at this point in time, it's one of those two kind of paths, whichever one works properly and um, well for the developer experience. Um, well, I think the the base everything on NuGet and fix it at that layer. All right, so that's that's more like what Sean was saying of the freezing at certain times, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, in my head, it's it that's how you implement what I was talking about earlier. It's yeah. it 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 forces us to use NuGet, right? Which is what lets us lock. Uh -huh. um, but with hand wavy magic, it lets us continue to build and and you know build the world. Uh -huh. I don't think it's that hard, um, you know. And and but again, it's I think it's a it's a it's some extra bit of build tooling that we need to figure out. Yeah, I I just think of like if it's if it's you know locking the versions, then we we lock all the versions for like preview zero. We do that build, and then we turn around and have to touch the entire repo again to unlock right. the versions again to move after preview zero that yeah. that it's a lot of project changes but maybe it's the right thing to do anyway maybe it, it may or or more specifically it may actually that. happen anyway why do you need to lock you would just do a build and everything would depend on the latest version and that's it <laughs> unless unless you want to provide preview zero builds that rely on previous preview zero builds. There's really no reason to lock. Except that uh, I, I, I want to be able to figure out how to do that, because that's what we're going to do when we ship. And if we don't do it in preview zero, then we do it in preview one so that we can start figuring out how to do it. I mean, you, you run my script saying, here's yeah. the version I want everything to reference, and then that's it. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it touches all the projects. And and maybe that's just fine. Maybe that maybe that is just it. it feels weird, but maybe that is just it. It's just like, yeah, here we go. Update everything. That's how you do the the quote unquote RTM build of any release. Yeah, we well, may have to we after the first release you wouldn't you would <laughs> You'd have to keep everything referencing data, the original one, because you're never going to release that again. 
until the day that we have to. But right, right, like there's a bug in it that we have to fix it. We just have to be prepared for that being a reality. Yeah, and I worry about the I worry about the project breadth approach because it makes it harder to during development to isolate yourself. Isolate yourself. I still want the ability to say, yeah, use the latest data from from Nougat, Nougat.org, um, while I continue to play in these other areas. Right. So you want the ability to build core without, and core is not a good example. You want to be able to build NetFX with extension without having to go and build all the way back to Digital. And yeah, core and absolutely. Data that that addresses. And data and that, well, I mean, that's one of the scenarios where, um, yeah, that. one of your goals yeah. for the extension repos is right. that you wouldn't have to build the world. Right. Because well, building the world is a challenge. If you don't build the other repos, then they won't be in your no local pool, which means they'll have to go out and use the released versions. Yeah, exactly. But that's a good thing. Yeah, I'm just. I want that. I'm so, saying that's what the that's the missing magic hand wavy stuff. We have to make yeah. that work. I think the hardest part is dealing with the nougat cache. Yes. I am worried about the nougat cache. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, is it even possible to use a local packages folder? It is. With, oh, but with it, the cache, that's the that's where I, I don't know who wins um, in that. The and cache that. wins. <laughs> and I've not been happy. Yeah, my, the cache can win a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, ideally, we'd have something to say don't cache anything from this source. Yeah, so there's a bit of investigation to do that. that that's why the, the idea of a NuGet pool may or may not work, or, or right. may be harder than it should be because the cache yeah. definitely was a thing on my mind when we were talking about the yeah. idea of it. Um, uh, uh, thoughts on app bear versus GitHub Actions? We haven't. You guys haven't mentioned that at all. Is it just a whichever one works? I, 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 I'm assuming. Is it's GitHub kind of, Actions really free, unlimited? Yeah, it's free, unlimited for open source for public repos. It looked like there were restrictions last time I looked. Like even free projects had a cap. I. That's, yeah, that's I want. That's my only. Problem with that. I, 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 yeah, I have this. I have similar vague memories. Um, although it's entirely possible, you know, Nat Friedman just said, "Nah." They've had several, you know, changes um, that don't get big announcements. Uh, I, I don't particularly care. Um, I am worried about. Um, I guess I'm worried about uh, oh, there it is. You know, whether whether it is we get two thousand minutes per month. Uh. That might be a thing then. So if each build is an average of five minutes, two hundred builds, maybe two hundred fifty builds a month. Well, that means no more mistakes in your pull request. <laughs> I say your meaning, yeah, all of us. Actually, I'm more concerned about the 500 megs of storage. That's not a lot when we have all these NuGet packages. Are we using? Mm -hmm. Hard to say. Hard to compare the app layer VM against the uh, GitHub VM. Although GitHub VM is actually kind of small. Dual core, seven gigs of RAM. Mm -hmm. 
so the app air builds also are pretty slow. Yeah. Be yeah, at least compared to bare metal. I mean if every build builds the world, that'll take a while, right? <laughs> Actually, that ooh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, that's half an hour at least. A half hour? Well, on these machines? Well, I mean, no, it's not. The, it takes what four minutes? Tools take six minutes. It's ten minutes right there. Our yeah. Extensions. Oh, we're, but our builds are also completely serialized today. That's true. Of course, if the GitHub Actions run on a two-core VM, that's not going to get a lot of <laughs> a lot of in there. Mm, it's all going to be this guy oh, anyway, but yeah. I mean, Dutal and Volutal also take like another ten minutes. Ten minutes together. Their dependencies. Why do they take ten? C plus plus takes that long. Well, we have four platforms. Oh. Well, we have three platforms, oh, three, three yeah. tool sets. Right. And that number is only going to grow. Well, not necessarily. That's going to be terrible. Yeah. For small changes, you have to wait a half hour. I'll have to think about that one a little bit more. Well, part of it will also be we can go to a single repo and still build fewer things or can play with yeah. what we build too. So, um, but the single repo then, if that step can be done first. The timing, I think a half hour is going to be pretty, I don't know, we'll see. That be brutal or not. Definitely yeah, don't want to I mean, run the integration yeah. test all the time. <laughs> How long does that take? True. How long does this take right now, Sean? Two minutes. What integration? All the burn installs take two minutes. They might be getting longer now that I've added more tests. Last time I ran it on a VM, it was yeah, it was just a couple minutes. Oh, okay. I guess I, I mean, there's a, there's like there was like a dozen or so tests at the time. I remember them being really, really slow, but I don't know why. Okay. All right. So this is a interesting thing. I'm going to look at it as I'm looking at the signing because I'm hoping that doing this makes life better and then also makes my signing project a little easier. But I, since I have to go through everything, I have to do everything. Um, so I will probably be experimenting with repos. I'll probably create a repo and destroy it and create a repo and destroy it. So don't don't get too excited as you see these things coming and going. Um, I will be uh, it's easier a lot of times to just blow things up than it is to try to keep, you know, hacking at them. Um, so I will be looking at, at those sorts of things as well then. All right. Um, and the GitHub Actions, I, I missed the... When it said free, and I went digging around, I missed the cap on it. That will have to go. I thought the cap was it. much bigger. 2,000 is not a lot. How many is that per work day, roughly? 20? Uh, if you say there's 20 work days in a month, then... If it's, yeah, it's only 2,000. Well... You're down to 100 per day? Yeah. That's and three bills it's not like a half hour? <laughs> That's not like we restrict ourselves to 20 work days a month either. Yeah, I don't know that we commit every day though either. So it's kind of you know, like true, true. Five days a week ish. I agree. We could also, again, yeah, we're gonna have we have to have the ability to build less than the world. So, yeah, your average CI build should be able to build less than the world. Yeah, that may be the way. But out. still, 
two thousand is not a lot of minutes. No, it's not. It might be sufficient, but I think it it's kind of cutting it close. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, it's a thing. I have to go decide how much I want to go investigate. Um, last thing. Um, we got through most of Sean's design questions. Um, this is going to keep me busy. I was thinking that maybe we needed to up the timing so we can get through all the design discussions, like by having another meeting next week. But I think hey, I'm you remembered. To- I, I did. I think I'm going to have, I'm going to have enough work. And if mine is the next really big work item, then the 18th of March may work just fine for the next meeting, um, given how much other stuff is in between there. Especially since I doubled my bug count today, I can just save that one for our discussions next 18th on the 18th. Um, Unless Sean, you need to talk about whatever that was, fifty-five ninety, before that. Um, but if if you do, we can find a way to talk about that. Um, given everything else, we'll just find that. All right. So I think we'll be back in two weeks. I don't think we're going to add next week. I think everything will work out. There's plenty of work between now and then, um, before I will get to that thing anyway. So anything else going on out yeah, there? That other bug is not pressing at all. Okay, then great. So we'll talk about it in two or more weeks, potentially, if because um, we'll talk about mine, and mine may take the whole time. Or not. We'll see. Maybe it'll go easy. We'll see. Um, all right. So we were at a two-hour meeting. Um, anything else? Cool. Um, I'm going to go back. I don't have the query. Do I? Yes, I do. Where is the query? Here it is. I hit refresh. I have 17 open. Man, I started the week at 17, and now I'm. Ah, yeah, but bummer. but but yesterday you you had the pleasure of being down into the single digits. I was in single so... digits for one day, not even one day, but for uh, overnight I was in single digits, and now I'm, <laughs> I'm not. So, um, and I don't know about some of these. Yeah. Oh, well. All right. Um, We'll be back in two weeks. I will be busy in between that time um, working on all things related to Wix. Uh, I hope all of you stay safe, stay healthy, um, and we'll do it same time, same place, two weeks from now. Till then, you guys, take it easy. Bye. Bye.